Hello. Uh, thank you all for being here. And thank you to Demetrius and Cody and Sarah and DeLorean and Ryan for putting on React Adelphia. Um, my name is Kelly Ennis, and I'm a software engineer at Xavier. I'm here today to talk about ClojureScript, which is a dialect of Lisp that compiles to JavaScript and has a pretty weird like development experience. Um, so warning, part of this is actually going to be like an intro to Lisp, uh, and a uh, secret aim for this is, uh, I guess, to convert people to want to try out Lisp, maybe. Um, so hopefully someone likes it. Um, to the extent that there's a thesis statement for this talk, there's two parts. Um, first, looking into other declarative UI frameworks um, can change our understanding of what we're doing when we write React code in JavaScript. This talk focuses on ClojureScript because I like it, uh, but there are potentially great similar talks on Reason React or Elm or Flutter or Swift UI uh, that I'd really love to see other people get. Um, second, using a Lisp like ClojureScript with React is pretty wild and potentially pretty powerful. React lets us write functions that declare what we want the UI to look like and do based on a combination of props and state. Lisp's most unique and alien feature is that its syntax takes place in the form of Lisp data structures, which means that when you write Lisp code, you are essentially programming in data. This means that when you write React code in ClojureScript, both the markup and the functions that emit that markup are all just various kinds of lists. Uh, hold on. So I lost my slide notes. Okay. So one of the applications I've worked on for the past year is the Open Apparel Registry, which aims to catalog every apparel facility in the world into an open data set. I'd like us to consider it a bit because it done so, does something that's pretty fundamental to web UI programming, which is to transform one data structure into another. For example, what this screen of the Open Apparel Registry draws is to transform a list of apparel facilities from the API into a set of interactive list items and a collection of markers on the map. So the data source is the Open Apparel Registry's Facilities API endpoint, which returns data serialized into GeoJSON, which is a standard format for representing geospatial data. So for instance, this JSON object has a type of feature collection, which indicates that it presents a list of features. There's also a list of features, which is an array of facility points, each of which has properties like name, address, and ID, along with the facility coordinates. What the React app does is to take this nested list and to transform it into this nested list, which is a collection of DOM elements that the browser knows how to render. Uh, in the browser, the user just sees the interactive list rather than the GeoJSON data. The way this is done probably looks pretty familiar. The code maps over the list of facilities to turn each facility into a single list item. After that, the React renderer does the work of figuring out how best to make that into a tree of DOM elements. This is probably pretty obvious stuff for us, but I think it feels obvious in part because mapping over lists of data into JSX is an extremely common thing to do in React code. One of the standard kinds of tutorial for learning React is a project that creates a to-do list application. And if you look at the Redux docs, its first example is also a to-do list. So it's probably not completely an accident that one of the main resources for comparing different web UI frameworks is to do MVC, a site which has dozens of example implementations of the same to-do list app. All right. Uh, which brings me to Lisp, which is an old language whose name stands for list processing and whose programs are written in the form of lists. I'm going to talk about common Lisp for a bit before moving to ClojureScript, but they are very similar because uh, Lisp is actually a family of similar dialects. 
the Lisp Wikipedia page has this great timeline of Lisp dialects, which shows off some of the most well-known ones. Common Lisp is named Common Lisp because it aimed to unify a bunch of different Lisp dialects into a common standard. Um, if you look at the bottom right corner of this, you'll see closure, uh, I guess starting 2010-ish, um, as well as a dialect called ARC, which is what Hacker News is written in. So here's a quote from the author of Land of Lisp that's like a little lament about why Lisp isn't very popular. Quote, to most programmers, Lisp seems like an entirely alien language at first. One thing that I think the Lisp community has failed to do is to convince other programmers that this strangeness is not an arbitrary obstacle, but a necessary adjustment that imparts great power to programmers that would otherwise be unattainable. Uh, I found this quote on a site that aims to do some branding for Lisp and has this like, uh, call it interesting logo. Uh, yeah, so not the best, but workable. Um, okay. Here's a quote from the inventor of Lisp. Quote, one can even conjecture that Lisp owes its survival specifically to the fact that its programs are lists, which everyone, including me, has regarded as a disadvantage. So what does this look like in practice? Okay. This is a common list program that adds one and two and evaluates to three. Let's note some things about the syntax. First, the plus operator is a function call, and function calls get prefixed. Second, the entire thing is surrounded by parentheses. Next, because of the way this is written, the Lisp interpreter would evaluate this immediately and reduce it to three. Finally, Lisp syntax is made up of lists that get evaluated and each element in these lists is generally referred to as a form. Uh, this is another list program. This one also evaluates to three, but note that the code here nests a, nests a list into another list. The way this would work is that it would evaluate the form on the right-hand side to two, and then evaluate the resulting form to three. Uh, now we've got a list of numbers without the plus function prefix, but with a quote prefixing the entire list. The single quote tells the interpreter not to try to reduce the list to something else, which means that it would just remain a list of numbers like an array in JavaScript. Uh, like JavaScript arrays, these, can these lists can contain different data types, including functions. So this program, for example, has a list of numbers prefixed by the plus function which is all included in a quoted list. The single quote will also prevent the interpreter from trying to evaluate this immediately, so it'll just remain a list. Uh, to evaluate it, we can use the eval function, which takes a list of forms as its argument and tries to read and evaluate that list as list code. This whole form will evaluate to 15. Here's a slightly different way to write that. The cons function takes two arguments and returns a new list with the first argument at the beginning, followed by the elements from the second argument. This is a bit like JavaScript rest or spread syntax. Um, so here the code creates a new quoted list with plus prefixing a list of numbers, uh, which is the inner form, um, and then evaluates that whole list to reduce it down to 15. Uh, if we wanted to turn this into a function which would sum any list of numbers, we can use a lambda function call to create an anonymous function, which is essentially like a JavaScript arrow function. This function takes a list of numbers as its argument and returns the sum of the list. To execute that, we can use fun call, Or we can use a more pleasant syntax, which is built into common Lisp as a macro and enables writing functions that look a little more familiar. Uh, note that it's probably not idiomatic to use eval like this, the way you would avoid it in JavaScript, but it works for an example. OK, so let's look at another Lisp function, uh, add. Um, the entire thing is a list of elements, including a couple of nested lists. The effect of nesting lists is to establish a tree. 
In other words, a tree can be represented as a nested list, and this has some pretty interesting implications. Um, for example, uh, I found a blog post that discusses how one could represent XML source code in whatever language as an XML tree. Uh, one of the author's examples is this C function, which adds two integers and returns an integer, which could be represented as this XML tree, which is set up in such a way as to nest the arguments, the function body, and the return value while encoding the type signature as attributes. You can probably see where this is going, but just to make it obvious, JSX is basically XML, but the tags are like function calls masquerading as markup. Sometimes library authors reveal the secret a little bit, as happens in the JSX control statements library. The library's documentation has this example of writing what is basically a switch block directly inside JSX, which determines what branch gets rendered depending on the condition. A blog post called JSX can do that has a slightly weirder example, which presents using JSX to write a function to calculate a hypotenuse. Note that the logic here is first the pow functions get evaluated and are available as arguments to sum. Next, sum is evaluated and is available as an argument to square root. And then last, the square root is evaluated and then that's the hypotenuse. So back to common lisp. Um, one of the main exercises in practical common Lisp involves creating a small library that can render HTML markup. When the library is loaded, it can be used by calling HTML on a list or a nested list of element names, attributes, and strings. The second example here maps a nested list of Lisp elements to a nested list of DOM elements. And it's basically the same operation as mapping GeoJSON to LI elements that we saw in the Open Apparel Registry. So here's one more Lisp function, which calculates the factorial of n. Lisp programming is very REPL driven in the sense that one will often work by writing a small amount of code, trying it out in the REPL, and then iteratively shaping it into doing the correct thing. The best open source Lisp programming environment is unfortunately Emacs using a thing called Slime, uh, which is also not great branding. Um, all right, so for example, uh, you can trace in using Slime, you can trace the execution of a function by using a trace function call, uh, trace function call on its name. What's happening in this screenshot is First, the factorial function in the editor at the top has been sent to be evaluated in the REPL on the bottom. Next, trace factorial has been called, which will print information each time the function is executed. And last, calling factorial five outputs the trace log below. Uh, Common Lisp also builds in a disassemble function, which you, can, which you can call to return the assembly code for any given function. Here's factorial in assembly. Lastly, comment Lisp has a quirky thing called conditional restarts, which will pause function execution and allow a user at the REPL or a handler in, uh, in running code to take some action when the program receives bad or malformed input. Since the name B here is not bound to any variable, the REPL presents a restarts prompt, which gives us a few possible actions we could take in response to the error, such as trying again, stopping execution, or even supplying a new value for B um, to restart the program. Closure is a newish dialect of Lisp that's meant to be very functional and pretty pragmatic. Here's its blurb from the Closure website. Quote, Closure is a dialect of Lisp and shares with Lisp the code as data philosophy and a powerful macro system. Closure is predominantly a functional programming language and features a rich set of immutable persistent data structures. When mutable state is needed, Closure offers a software transactional memory system and reactive agent system that ensure clean, correct, multi-threaded designs. One interesting thing about Clojure is that it aims for a number of deployment targets, and it accomplishes this by making it so that Clojure code can be compiled to the JVM, to the .NET common language runtime, 
or to ES3 flavored JavaScript. This makes it a little bit like JavaScript in the sense that you can use it to build web applications, desktop apps, native mobile apps, APIs, and so on. Uh, Clojure, compiled to ES, uh, Clojure compiles to ES3 flavored JavaScript using a thing called the Google Clojure compiler, which is, sounds similar, but not related really at all. Um, the tool is sort of like Webpack in that it works as a compiler and a linker, but the Clojure compiler also aims to do fairly aggressive code minification as one of its default settings. In practice, it achieves this through changing names and source code rewriting procedures to make them smaller, and removing unused code altogether through a process called dead code elimination. Um, this last thing is a thing Webpack can also do. I think it's called like tree shaking there, um, and you have to give it a specific configuration in the Webpack to config to make it work. So here's closure syntax in the form of a factorial function. This looks very similar to the common Lisp version, but there are a couple differences to point out. In this function, for example, take a look at the arguments list. It takes a, it takes, it uses brackets instead of parentheses, and that's because the def in macro expects its arguments list in the form of a vector rather than a list. Closure generally has a larger set of built-in data structures than common Lisp does, um, like vectors and sets and maps. So although the, the syntax still takes place in the form of the data structures, the number of data structures to know is larger. Here's another closure function, which adds two numbers in a slightly wonky way by incrementing y as necessary to update the value of x as the function recurs. This is, of course, a kind of roundabout way to do it, but I wrote it like this to show off two things. First, the con form here is like a switch statement in JavaScript, and it takes the form of a list of conditions paired with their return values. At first, this can be a little hard to follow, but the syntax basically is, if y is zero, return x, and so on. The syntax works by virtue of having conditions and expressions be paired. The closure interpreter will even validate that the number of forms in the cond expression is even, and it'll throw an error if it's odd. Uh, secondly, note the recur function at the end, um, which is essentially there as an optimization for the compiler to know that this is recursive, so make it work or whatever. Uh, so that, uh, this is a closure data structure called a map. Um, you can think of the map data structure as essentially like a JavaScript object or a Python dictionary, but notice that it doesn't have any commas or colons to associate the keys with the values. Um, this one also works according to a pairing logic. Um, the idea is that uh, essentially like a key is paired with the next value, the next key is paired with the next value, the next key is paired with the next value. So in this, north is the key whose value is zero, East is the key whose value is one, and so on. Um, again, this will also just work by virtue of having an even number of forms, um, although you can nest maps and other collections within maps so that you can have a key whose value is a map, and so on. Okay. Uh, here's a closure script function from the reagent documentation that renders a React component. Reagent uses React directly as part of the library, which means that, that one gets the performance benefits of the virtual DOM and also all of React's features, um, but is able to write code in ClojureScript using what's called hiccup syntax rather than JavaScript and uh, JSX. Uh, you can probably tell what this does just by looking at it, but it's worth unpacking it a little bit just to, to understand what the syntax is doing. Um, first, all of the markup is a vector of vectors, which is why these braces are, or the brackets are nested, essentially. Um, they're nested in the same way that these would occur in the DOM. Um, second, the vectors also generally work according to a pairing logic. So if you look at the P element at the top, the element is paired with its inner text. Likewise, the strong element is paired with its text, and the style map is paired with another map that is specific style attributes. Um, last, you can declare a class by using this dot class name syntax, and you can do a similar thing for uh, 
hash symbol ID. This is the shell command. This shell command is the reagent equivalent of create react app to do list. Linengin is the standard closure build tool, and its nearest equivalent in JavaScript world is npm. So for example, you can use it to install dependencies, create production bundles, start development servers, run linters and tests, and start new projects from templates. Uh, this command will create a new application called to-do list using the reagent front end template. Plus CIDR at the end will configure the project to use CIDR, uh, use the CIDR REPL in development. And there are also other potential plus, plus, plus options for doing things like adding routing or style sheets or other add-ons. CIDR is Clojure's equivalent of Slime, and it turns Emacs into an IDE for writing Clojure programs. CIDR lets developers do things like evaluate code in a REPL and look up documentation directly within the editor. There's also a well-regarded Visual Studio Code plugin called Calva that makes it into a Clojure programming environment. Um, I haven't used it, but looking at its documentation, it appears that it has many features that CIDR does, like inline evaluation and having a running REPL to attach to. So when programming with CIDR or Calva, developers can use the REPL to run functions directly, including functions that work as React components. This say hello to name component, for example, takes a name string prop and an exclamation Boolean prop and returns a set of HTML elements. The bottom half of the editor has a CIDR REPL in which we've called the function using different sets of props in order to see what it outputs. Um, and if you look, it's essentially the common Lisp HTML generation library, just with uh, brackets instead of parentheses. Okay. Uh, as we already know, the best way to evaluate any web UI framework is to see how it works for a to-do list application. Uh, in order to present some more complicated reagent code, I made a little clone of to-do MVC that allows users to enter to-dos, complete or delete them, filter them by status, and save them to local storage. Here's a reagent component that, re that renders a to-do list item conditionally. Again, this is just a nested list, but this one has some additional complexities. First, we want users to be able to toggle a switch to view only unfinished items. So the code introduces a check on whether the list item should render at all. The let block at the top assigns a, that check to a variable whose value depends on the status of the item and a value in the store. This makes the value of should render item available throughout the function. Next, note that the expression output begins with this and should render item phrase, um, which you can think of, I guess, as the closure script version of the React uh, Boolean double ampersand component thing that will short circuit if Boolean is false um, for conditional rendering. Uh, last, you can see on the input and the button elements that there are these maps, um, which help set up their on-click and on-change handlers. Um, similar to how this is work in Redux, the functions get dis when these events happen, the functions get dispatched to the central store, which takes the form of a thing called an atom. Um, by default, Regent does state management using a modified version of a closure built-in called atoms. We can think of these as being like the React use state hook um, in the sense that the atoms offer a way to offer some kind of like mutable state in the midst of a set of, in the midst of a set of otherwise immutable functions. Here are the atoms storing the to-do list application state, one which is persisted to local storage, and the other, which is ephemeral. These atoms are basically just maps, similar to how Redux state is just a JavaScript object, but the R atom function call gives them some special getter and setter methods. To get the value of some piece of the application state, reagent atoms provide a capability called a cursor, which is like a lens for looking at the current value of a particular piece of the state. Um, and you can note that this is the cursor is at the top and it has this like sequence of essentially sequence in a vector that is walking the path to to do 
dot data or whatever, if you think of it in terms of a JavaScript object. Um, so when application code wants to access this value, it has to use the cursor name prefixed with an at sign. Um, and I guess the word for this is dereferencing that uh, um, is essentially like, like depending on a value in the state. To update the application state, atoms have capabilities like swap and reset, which set a new state from scratch or as a function of the old state. Um, so it's not quite clear, but reset here is just essentially setting it from scratch to empty input state. Um, the swap call here is actually calling a function on the state as it goes through and just like adding something to it. Um, when the value of the to-do data cursor changes, any components that depend on that value will re-render like they would in React. Okay, uh, this is another reagent component that renders a switch input for rendering, uh, rendering a switch input for filtering list items. It's a nested list that evaluates to a set of DOM elements, has some local variables, and adds a change handling function to the input element. Uh, reagent components can also use React lifecycle methods when declared in a special way. Uh, because I frequently work with Leaflet in JavaScript React, one of the first things I tried out in Reagent was setting up a Leaflet map, which requires using some lifecycle methods. So here we've got render, component did mount, and component did update. Render is pretty simple. It just creates a static div element with an ID that Leaflet can use to instantiate a map. Here are component did mount and component did update. Component did update is also pretty straightforward. Essentially, it checks when a new set of props comes in. It determines whether it needs to remove a layer and add a layer to the map. Um, component did mount is a little more complicated. Um, essentially, what the code is doing here is to create a new leaflet map instance by calling lmap with the ID of the div that we've given it, um, then imperatively set the map center and zoom then create a new tile layer to use as the base map and add some event handlers to update the app state whenever the user zooms or pans. And then finally, we make this into, like we attach a ref to this so that other components can, can access the leaflet map if necessary. Uh, leaflet map did mount also has an example of how closure script interrupts with JavaScript. If you look at the JSL call in the, I guess in the let buck at the top, that's essentially we're calling the, uh, I guess the dot map method from the leaflet object there, and all the dot methods are essentially lookups for, for JavaScript methods. Um, you can also see this CLJ arrow JS function there, which is a way to transform a closure map object into a JavaScript object. Um, there's a reverse version of this, which is JS to CLJ, and you will do this a lot if you have to work with it. Um, okay. So finally, I wanted to close by mentioning Reframe, which is essentially Redux for Reagent. Reframe has a pretty opinionated architectural pattern, which is lo worth looking into if you're interested in uh, using Elm or Redux, um, because the pattern there is one that could be used in other frameworks. Um, the general idea is that it imagines a loop of functions through which your data flows. Um, and then the functions update the DOM as necessary, depending on what the shape of the data is. Um, so the documentation has this extensive tutorial about how it works. Um, it's pretty, I would describe it as dogmatic, um, but it also includes this like weird bit where it compares the whole pattern to the water cycle. Um, so yeah, this is worth checking out if you're uh, even mildly interested in it. Um, so anyway, like Lisp, ClojureScript, and Reagent, Reframe is worth learning because it can give us new ways to think about what we're doing when we write React code in JavaScript. And that's the end. Uh, I will drop this in Philly Dive Slack or something, but I actually made an appendix here that just has like links and other resources for learning a Lisp if you are super interested. Uh, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Kelly. Do you, do you uh, have time for some questions? Will you take some questions? Sure. Does anyone have any questions? This is a two-parter. So the first one's quick. 
would you do this again using all the same tech or would you do it in purely React? Uh, meaning JavaScript React? Yeah, JavaScript React. Uh, I'm going to answer your question differently, which is like, should this be used in production or whatever? Uh, I don't know if that's what you're asking, but like, I would do this again for sure because I think it's fun, but also it's a to-do list app uh, uh, and it doesn't have to be deployed. Um, I think the question of using it in production is like different because again, it's like, uh, an alien language to learn in a way um, that's pretty powerful, but like I imagine it's hard to hire ClojureScript developers. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so leading into that, uh -huh. if you do use this again in production for whatever kind of application, what are the main driving reasons to use this as opposed to some of the other more traditional approaches? Like just using like Ramda or some, something functional in oh, JavaScript right. that's still JavaScript, not Clojure. Yeah. Uh, to the extent that it's a value, I think developer fun is pretty important. Um, I like think that one virtue of like working with Lisp and Closure Script is this that it's straight up fun to use, um, which isn't a great argument for using it instead of JavaScript and Ramda. Um, the argument I think that you might hear from like people that do use Closure Script and Closure in production is that it is faster and easier to do things more correctly in it because of like the way that the language has been set up to have nice defaults. Um, so if you think about all the like stuff we do to achieve immutability in JavaScript, um, which is a lot, uh, you just get that for free in Clojure. Um, um, I have a question. Um, so I noticed like uh, some of the methods in there that were like mapped to the JavaScript methods, like uh, I guess like component dash did dash update would be camel case component did update in, in React. Is there like a, um, or, you know, component uh, did mount or whatever. Is there like a layer in which those things get mapped that you have to set up in preparation for this project? Reagent gives you that, uh, sorry, Reagent gives you yeah. all that stuff for free. Um, and there's like a kind of quirk, which is that, uh, so, let me move up to this one, uh, which has the R create class thing here. This is essentially calling like reagent dot create class, if you think of it in terms of JavaScript. Um, and it is essentially making sure that it gives you this function that accepts a map that does lifecycle methods on it. Otherwise, you just have sort of like pure functions that are, you know, accept this and render that. Um, I think that secretly under the hood, all reagent component functions are React class components. Um, but to get the like lifecycle methods, you have to do something like this. Got it. Thank you. 